The Sign Institute of Policy and Politics is American University's incubator for policy innovation. We convene leaders in the academic, public, private, nonprofit, and journalism sectors to engage and promote common ground and nonpartisan solutions. In an evolving world, we seize the opportunity to work on the nation's most pressing challenges through collaboration by experts and top scholars in their field with students in research and scholarship. As part of that goal, the Sign Institute leverages American University's location in our nation's capital, the nexus of government and a growing international business center. We connect diverse perspectives from around the country and around the world with our world-class academics and research, experienced practitioners, and the most politically active student body in the US. We stand apart through our focus on the role of business and the nonprofit community in public policy, the rise of the importance of economic regions in the United States and international policy issues. Our focus is to make an immediate impact at the intersection of policy and politics that leads to real and lasting change. Thank you for joining us as we convene, communicate, and collaborate. Introducing Sign Institute Fellow 2022, Barbara Comstock. Good afternoon. I'm Barbara Comstock, and it's wonderful to be with you again this afternoon for our class on women in the arena. And all of, I've been so privileged to have met so many wonderful women along the way. And as we discussed last week, um, obviously there are a lot more Democrat women who these days who are in politics. And just a few years ago, it was much more disproportional Democrat women versus Republican. And part of the reason why we had such success in 2020 was because of uh, many of the women who got active and engaged, ran for office, but behind the scenes of somebody who was very much a part of it on the Republican side, I think just really a top leader for women, Republican women uh, across the board is our guest today, Annie Dickerson. And Annie has a wonderful career that intersects policy and politics with the whole Sign Institute is all about. And I just wanted to give you an overview first. She's just one of my favorite people, but she has had it's a very interesting career. She is a native Detroiter from a family of seven kids. Seven kids. So you know, she's used to dealing with a lot of people, a lot of discussion and, and being engaged. And um, tragically, she did uh, lose her oldest sister to COVID this year. So like so many of us, she's had you know, tough times dealing, you know, with, with what we've been going through over the past year and, and our prayers were with Annie on, on that loss. She is a Michigan State University grad. She began her career as a finance director to the Michigan Republican Party. So state and local politics being, you know, where you're from, start where you are. That's what she did. She, um, then became the finance director to help elect a U.S. Senator who was Spence Abraham of Michigan. Um, and um, he later on went on to be the energy secretary. So she was active there, you know, came from Michigan, a swing state where she was always had lots of things to do there. Uh, because of her success in Michigan, she became a deputy finance director for the George W. Bush uh, reelect in 2000 to 2004. Along the way, she also, and I think this is where we met, was she was chief of staff to the U.S. ambassador to Switzerland. So she got to go to Switzerland with that really awesome job where when you're working with an ambassador, everybody comes through, you know, particularly when you're in Switzerland. I think I met her because I was working for John Ashcroft. We went um, over to Davos and got to visit there, and then we we liked it so much, we went back in the summer for another event and uh, that began a beautiful friendship with, with Annie. She also uh, has, has two children that she was raising in Switzerland while this was all going on. Then she was a finance director to a presidential campaign. So that's always adventurous um, in 2008 cycle. Then she's worked the last 15 years as director of the family office to one of New York City's um, hedge fund billionaires, most prominent, somebody who's very politically active. And it was at that time that she um, then 
became, you know, started winning for women and becoming really involved in get, helping so many of the women on the Republican side that you see who are active today. And then um, she is now after starting winning for women, having that great, in 2020, they were supposed to, it was going to have 20 women in 20, in 2020, because Republicans after 18 cycle, which I was part of, had lost a lot of women and we were down to only 11, I believe it was, it was pretty pathetic. <laughs> um, so the goal was 20 and 20, far exceeded it, got over, I think it was 31, maybe we're at 32 now. So really did a bang up job there. And now she spends most of, uh, more of her time, uh, you know, on this passion to elect women to public office through this Winning for Women that she personally founded in 2017, but was helping us before then. And then she was uh, part of, you now this is an, another thing that I think she's gonna, she can tell you about because as part of her career, um, she was part of the original steering committee to make gay marriage legal in New York in 2011 uh, by doing a video on that. And, and of course she's a Republican. She was you know, part of a bipartisan coalition there. So another one of the interesting policy things she got to do. So um, I know I've gone on a little too long, but she has such an interesting and diverse career I just wanted to let you give you that background before she comes in and starts. So Annie, welcome and thank you so much. And I just, you know, just opening up to, you know, you tell us a little bit about um, your passion for policy and politics and this wonderful route that has taken you to be able to be engaged in so many, you know, domestic and foreign policy issues, as well as putting um, women in office and um, being a great mentor to all of us. So welcome. Well, thanks, Barbara. Um, really great to be here with everybody. Barbara and I met. Um, Barbara, I think you were meet, uh, I think you were working. And um, anyway, I was doing call and pass. Um, on behalf of the U.S. Embassy in Switzerland, and everybody might be well aware that the World Economic Forum is hosted by an NGO based in Geneva. So um, I was appointed by the White House um, to be the chief of staff to our American ambassador. And that was a really good gig because not only did I... Um, uh, get to do the World Economic Forum and um, help advance the trips of Colin Powell, who I think is one of our great American heroes um, and one of the greatest uh, secretaries of state, if I don't mind saying, um, and just really being able to spend time with him was a real honor. Um, Berlin just beginning to get a divorce. So you can imagine that I was a single, getting ready to be a single mom. Um, and I was raising two kids overseas. And one of the reasons um, that I was given this appointment is that at Michigan State University, where I went to college, I was a French and German major. Ooh. So I, I, I was basically uh, doing government level uh, language. So I was able to do the diplomatic um, mission, you know, primarily in French, but every now and then, you know, of Deutsch as well in German. Um, so it was a really good experience. So one of my boys wanted to learn French, the other wanted to learn German. So um, you can imagine here I am a, almost a single mom, getting ready to be a single mom, taking on this new duty, you know, in a foreign country, one wants to speak French, the other is German. So our dinner conversations were in every language <laughs> and, and that was a good thing. So that was a really good experience. Basically, um, having been in politics, you know, prior to that, being the deputy finance director in the Bush campaign and um, being a finance director for senators and governors, um, it really set me up, you know, to the move that I made to New York to support a presidential uh, race and be the finance director there um, in what was turned out to be a zoo. 
um, and crazy. Any of you who've done any politics, much less presidential politics, you can really appreciate um, the nuttiness. Basically, every situation is an emergency, we think. And, um, you know, the barn is on fire every night, right, Barbara? I mean, that's just oh, the yeah. world of politics. So um, that was, but it was really experienced. And um, it led to me meeting one of the major donors to the presidential campaign, who was the essentially the finance chair. And he asked me to be the director of his family office. Um, so I've done that for the last 15 years and just um, re doing the policy and philanthropy um, very well healed and politically active um, hedge fund guy. So that was basically the backdrop and only recently, Barbara, was I able to go off on my own and really explore my passion, which is um, what you mentioned earlier, um, helping um, women to get elected, um, more of them to higher office. Um, and in, in addition, you know, helping women in general in leadership, um, mentoring young women uh, to become the leaders of tomorrow. I mean, Barbara and I can only be around so long. Um, we need the next generation um, of young women to really get the reins um, and really lead um, us into the next uh, generation. And we know you're going to do it ably. So with that, Barbara, maybe that's a stopping point until you, um, knowing if you want to talk about one thing or another. Yeah, no, and uh, well, thank you. You know, see, what I one of the things I love about doing this and we talk about the importance of relationships is I always learn new things about my friends. I didn't know you could fluent <laughs> French and German. I cannot. So I know we have a lot of students interested in international uh you know, policy and politics. So obviously language is a good thing to learn these days. It's one of those things I still should pick up. Uh, so uh, that is fascinating. But I think maybe turn, turning to, you know, kind of preparing women um, to run because you've been so involved in that now. I think I, I now you're just hearing and, and, and thinking about all of your career, you were seeing leaders like Colin Powell, seeing business leaders, mm. seeing fundraising leaders, seeing ambassadors. Mm seeing all those leadership traits in action, you know, from, from a swing state in the middle of the country in Michigan to New York City to overseas. So I think that explains a lot of why you've always been so good with all of the candidates because you have that 360 degree worldview. So as you're talking to women, and I know one of the things we did, because you helped me back when I first ran for the state house. So you were there before even Congress. And I remember getting that call to say, hey, we're gonna help you out. And I was like, whoa, wow. <laughs> I was so, I was like, I better win when someone gives you a big check. <laughs> it's, it's like, I don't want my friends out to be happy with me. So, um, yeah, so it, it, that was such a, you know, uh, such a trust thing that, you know, made me, you mm -hmm. know, just want to, want to win and, and work so hard. So when my big 422 vote win, but um, talk about maybe how, you know, how you vet candidates, what you look for, what you've seen over that time, because you've been, you know, involved, you know, you know, in, in politics at so many levels for such a long time. Right. So um, what kind of th preparation do you think, I mean, I know it's more and more diverse now, we talk about that too, but um, what have been some of the key things that you think have made for, you know, good campaigns and that you look for? Yeah. Um so let me just say that you was one of the smartest things that I've done. Um, are you able to hear me all right? Yep. Good. Okay, great. Um, so look, the reason I started um, a center-right organization to help center-right women get um, organized, uh, raise money and win, I saw what smartly they did with Emily's list, which, uh, by the way, for those who don't know it, is a brilliantly run organization. Goodness, it's lasted for the last 30 years. And it's called Emily's List. And I always thought Emily was some figure, 
right? The woman who began the organization or her oldest daughter. No, Emily stands for early is yeast. Early money is like yeast. That's what Emily's List started because the founders of Emily's List believe, and I do as well, that in order to get women elected, they have to have a fear of playing ground and they have to have money. Um, and we found that doubly so on the right. Um, when we went into the 2020 election, Barbara, uh, you might be aware, and those who are on this may not be, the Republican House caucus only had 11 women, yeah. right? Now, compare that to the 88 women that the left had, that the Democrats have, and you saw this insane waiting of women that the left had done a good job through Emily's List and other orgs in really building and raising money and helping elect their women. It had done such a poor job. So we go into the 2020 elections like down to the lowest number of women we'd had in the caucus gal in like, in like 20 years. Not only were we going forward, we were going way backwards. So we put, we pumped real money in, you know, we mentored our women. We helped to get good women into races by talking them into running if they were somebody who was on the bubble. Um, and we got women to run and we had 20 net wins. But in winning for women that Barbara has been good enough to be on the board of, thank you, Barbara. Um, it's, you know, not all women are created equal. So while I loved energizing and empowering women, while I love raising up women, it's important that we have women on the left and the right leading more and more. Um, they're not all equal. In order to get our endorsement, um, we you have to be what we call sane and sober. Um, and what that means to me is, you know, you've got to be a woman that is not just looking out to be a media celebrity. You're not just, you know, a woman who wants to use a certain rhetoric, endorsements of, you know, rhetorically maybe gifted but outrageous individuals um, in order to get elected that are the future of the GOP, the future of America, who are sane, sober, smart, leaderly, take policy seriously um, and dig in and make a difference. Because at the end of the day, um, all that we're asked to do, other than to love and be loved, I mean, that's what we really want, the essence of life, right? But we wanna make a difference. And so I'm looking for women that are wanting to make a difference and not just with themselves, but with others. So I said to one of our winning for women endorsees the other day, who has been on television a lot lately, um, and she does a good job. She's a media, you know, hit, but she's also a very smart, sober woman, and she's fighting for all sorts of good rights, you know, whether it's gay rights or you know, right to keep more of your money that you, that you earn. And she's just a really good, well-rounded woman. But I said to her the other day, I haven't heard a word while you've been on air lately that's referenced for your constituents. And I said, that makes me sad because it makes you. And when you're an official, you're a servant. And if you don't adapt a servant mentality right away, we can just as easily, um, you know, unnominate you. <laughs> you know? So um, she was in tears because one of the jobs Barbara knows, and I take my job really seriously of mentoring and speaking the truth to power. You know, I don't care that they're elected officials. I've worked for elected officials all my life. Presidents of the United States, Secretary of States, <laughs> Um, 
uh, government officials speaking to them in French, German, or English. You know, oh, big whoop. What matters is who you are as a human being. And what are you doing to make a difference? So um, Barbara, women that we think in that direction and have a biography and life experience of having done just that, um, giving it away, becoming, dedicating themselves to a policy um, and hiring the right staff uh, that is so like-minded. You can get way off on course, you know, hiring, um, you know, at GC, um, somebody who's supporting and direct um, can really lead you astray. So, you know, we want to make sure that they're well-rounded and that they're surrounding uh, with like-minded individuals. Yeah, and that's what a lot of, and I'm glad you mentioned Emily's list. And, and for those listening at the end, we do have, um, we're at two o'clock in the program, we're going to go through a lot of the different groups because there's a lot of groups there that will both teach you like campaign school. So whether you want to work on a campaign or be a candidate, um, you know, how, how to mentor and come forward. There's groups that then endorse and support women. And, you know, so there's a lot of different ones on each side of the political aisle. And, you know, I think one of the things they all have in common is a lot of women helping women. And that's, you know, that's what uh, winning for women was. Like we, you know, um, you know, Annie was, you know, coming in and, and talking to all of us along with our races, but then putting us together with other women that were being supported so that by the time we got into Congress or into the State House, we already had relationships for governing and getting policy done. And we often had policy, I mean, the kind of policy people that we were able to be put together in her group and the, everything that she worked on was had a very deep policy bench that was very um, helpful for, you know, for the candidates who might not have that background uh, before. So, you know, whether you're interested in being a candidate yourself or working on a campaign, um, you know, these women's groups that are involved in this really do have that unique situation where, you know, uh, you know, we need more women who are campaign managers. All of my campaign managers, except actually my first one, um, were women, and they were all fabulous. Um, I was very fortunate that my first campaign manager was fabulous too, um, but he continued to work with us and help mentor all of uh, the women who were uh, our campaign team. So, you know, those uh, oftentimes when you're running, people think, um, you know, they, they don't realize a lot of the just basic things you have to do, like Annie mentioned, like talk to your constituents. When I, when I ran for office as a delegate, I knocked on doors and I knocked on 10,000 doors. It was also a great weight lo loss program at the time <laughs> because, you know, to meet everybody, I had to just be out there every day knocking on doors and doing that. I had learned that from working on other campaigns of successful candidates. And I had learned that from going to campaign schools and telling other candidates the same thing. So what we did find, and I think a lot of our successful candidates had come from state or local office because they already had that base of you know constituents that were supporting them, working with them, and and they had already fundraised you know for a local campaign, so they could now kind of it's, it's like a small business. If you're state and local, you can take that small business and then ratchet it up. And I think one of the things we saw in 2020 was we were looking for those type of people who had that previous experience because we saw on the Democrat side that they got a lot, they they could get a lot of those people elected because they already had that base. It's it easier there. So um, uh, one of the things I think, and because you've had such a background in, in fundraising, one of the things that we always hear, you know, the early money is like yeast, is that it's hard for women to fundraise. So one of the things I always tell people, you know, whether you can only give 10 or $25 or write those big checks, start going to events. You know, if you're ever interested in running or just helping people, be one of those people who writes the checks. Even if you can't write the check, um, 
go and help at the event because then you're going to be at the fundraising event. You're going to understand that. So, I mean, I did, when I couldn't write the checks, I, I volunteered for the fundraisers and then tried to throw in a little in the pot because whatever amount it is, you know, do a little bit more than you can. And because then you're invested. And so the more people you can get invested, but maybe give us a little overview on some of the myths uh, and challenges for women, because sometimes, you know, it, it's hard for everyone to fundraise. I remember Eric Cantor told me, yep, it's hard. I do it every day. I have to call everybody. And so having learned from great people like you and Eric, I, I had never fundraised before, but it's just, you got to call everyone, you know, meet new friends, call people you don't know, and you just got to do it yeah. every day, like exercise. <laughs> how, it, how do you? It, it's not easy. No. Um, and that's saying it as, you know, somebody who's been doing it many years. Um, you know, it really takes time. I find that it's like, um, it's building relationships. Um, I'm at a point where I know the various donors, they're friends, and I'm a donor now. Um, I donate. Um, I put my money where my mouth is, just like you do, Barbara. So if I'm going to endorse somebody, I, I max out. I give them the maximum allowed by law. But, even, but, you know, it's funny because even going to my friends, now that a lot of these donors are my friends over these years, and some of it's just because I've been around for a long while and, you know, I'm old now, that they become peers. Um, it's still hard to go to your friends and ask for money. So I know it might be hard for college kids to imagine that it's hard to ask for money because, you know, when I was a college kid, asking my dad for money or mom was really easy. <laughs> <laughs> I did it every week, but, but, um, but no, in reality, um, you know, it, 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 it is hard and you just have to know that it's part of the game and, um, and having, you know, folks like me and you out there that are helping them so that it's not only the candidate that's dialing for dollars every day, as it were. Um, I'm doing that. Um, I do events for my women um, all around the country. So the best way that I utilize my donor relationships is not only to ask them to write a check, but for them to get their friends to write checks. So what I do is my friend Joe, uh, Pablo in Dallas, I say, I just saw his email come up. So I thought of him. Uh, Joe is going to do an event for a number of our women. And he's going to invite all his network. And then his host committee is going to invite their networks. So that's the way to do it. So all told, by the end of this year, winning for women would have done probably a dozen or more events and probably raised three, four million dollars to help our women. And really honestly, Barbara, that's the way to get it done is you got to spread it out. A candidate can't do it all. I can't do it all. So I need to call my, upon my friends who call upon their friends. It's almost like a pyramid scheme, you know, like you do this and then you roll out and you ask your five friends and you have your five friends, he ask their five friends. And before you know it, you have a real event and you raise real money. That's how you do it. Yeah, and, I, and it's, I know it's often intimidating because I know I remember talking to a candidate who ran um, for office, who decided to run for probably, you know, his first office, he wanted to be, a, you know, statewide and thought, oh, I'm just going to run statewide. And I said, well, you've got to call all your friends and ask them for money. And he said, well, my friends don't have money. And I said, well, okay, your friends have money that maybe they can't give you $10,000, but they can give you, if you've, you know, if you've done things with them, you've been engaged in the community, you've been involved, they probably could write you a hundred dollar check. You know, I mean, they know that you're a reliable, good person. And they went, and so part of it often, I've, I've often told people, if you, if you don't have sort of a 200, I, I think this was something that a campaign school said too once, if you don't have like a 250 person Christmas card list of people you send cards to who you have relationships with, who you'd call, you probably still should make, you know, more friends and, and interact in your community because you meet friends through 
you know, I mean, over the years, I know when I, you meet yeah. friends through your kids' school, or if you don't have kids, you meet it through, you get involved in, say, your local political party, and you meet people there. Now, that can be activists yeah. who aren't big donors, but they're small donors. You can meet people from, you know, you work with your local chamber of commerce, or you work with, you know, Habitat for Humanity. You've been there, you know, pounding those <laughs> nails in with a friend there, and and you've all given to those charities, and now you call those people and say, hey, I want to take those values that we share and bring right. them to Congress or bring them to the state house. Right. And so do, I, I'm not saying think of everyone you ever work with as a donor, right. but understand that all of your relationships over a lifetime, I mean, I never planned on yeah. running for office and I was amazed. I started having a check come in. So a guy was kind of giving me a regular $250 check would kind of come in every few weeks in my first campaign. And I thought, or maybe it's, now, what is this? I don't know this person. They live nearby me and I don't know them or I can't re remember that I know them. So I went and knocked on their door just to thank them for <laughs> thank you for giving me this money. I, was, I hadn't knocked on your door yet. And he said, oh, your daughter played basketball with my daughter. Wow. And your daughter That's was funny. wonderful and mentor oh. her because she was younger. Oh. Your daughter was such an awesome basketball player. That I thought yeah. if you covered the way she played basketball, I'd like you to be in there. And he goes, and I'm a yeah. Republican and I share, but I I was taken aback by wow, my daughter yeah. playing awesome basketball. She was captain right. of the baseball, but also captain of the soccer team. So that helped too. But um that's the kind, you know. So I, I think people always say, Well, I don't know people. Well, it's it's sort yeah. of the life you make over time and those relationships. So don't think of it just as I'm involved right. in political things. It's your whole community and how you engage. Now you go beyond your community to raise money, but right. um, I think people, I think women are often intimidated because, or actually in this case of this candidate who said, I don't have friends who can write checks. He was, um, he was a man. And I just said, well, it's like everything else. You know, I mean, I said, have you raised money for a charity or a friend? I mean, I had been the balloon lady at school. So I had to hand out all the balloons and at the school auction and I raised money for the school auction. So I said, okay, it's like that. So yeah. go try something else. Yeah. And even if it's just having a small dollar event right. you're a college student or you're just out of college, if you can right. bring 10 or more people together who will volunteer and or write a $25 check you become valuable to a campaign and you in turn, you know, can plug into a lot of different networks. So yeah. I think start for people who are intimidated, start small now, right. help the candidates you care about in whatever way. And then that, to my surprise, led to fundraising ability that right. I never thought I'd have. Like I, exactly. you know, I had met Annie and when she jumped in and said, oh, I saw you running and I was just so flattered and honored that she's in New York and she was going to help me. And that, you know, so those are the kind of things you learn along the way, but it yeah. is um, relationships. <laughs> can I, can I also mention that um, I almost think more importantly than the money um, is coalition building, you know, um, you were very excellent at that, Barbara and building bridges um, the example that, um, if you don't mind that I chat about for a moment, is how we want marriage equality, the right for a person, uh, for gay people to marry um, in New York, um, is a really good example of coalition building and money, uh, because we had to put money into the till. But people may not realize, but that is as late as 2009, the state of New York had voted down marriage equality. The state of New York voted down marriage equality. <laughs> and California had had one of their famous ballot initiatives um, in Prop 8. Um, and marriage equality lost there as well. So what we did is um, fortunately, um, I worked for a philanthropist that while he's conservative on fiscal and other matters, was very pro-gay. 
and pro-LGBT, um, it enabled me to roll up my sleeves because like a lot of you, I have an equal prevalent number of friends who are gay and I have a child who's trans. And so I was very delighted to get involved in this issue. And I um, headed up a steering committee that had the conservatives working with the Republicans working with the Democrats to try to get marriage equality passed in New York in 2011. All right. So it had already gone down. And now we're going to try to take it on 2011. Andrew Cuomo had just gotten elected. And the and that was before he became creepy and true Cuomo, I guess I can <laughs> say that because the dem, that's what Christian Gillibrand calls him. So I'm okay. Um, but um, it, the, at the time, New York State had a Democrat um, state house and a Republican state Senate. So they wanted to legislate marriage equality, not to a ballot initiative. They wanted it to actually be you know, just really argued and debated and, and give it the right hearing. And, but the Republicans weren't allowing it through until we got involved. So we hired a conservative lobbyist and um, we raised money. That was my job to raise money am amongst the Republican donors. And we put together this really badass steering committee that had left, right, center, and people that cared about marriage. This is why it mattered. Because prior to this, the whole LGBT issue and LGBT rights, okay, much less marriage, um, were always the province of the left, of the Democrats. And Republicans, even if they agreed, had never really engaged. And to be honest, the left really didn't want us to engage. They wanted to get marriage equality passed because they had begun it and they, and they wanted to end it. And my friend, Evan Wolfson, who wrote the paper on marriage equality when he was like a Princeton you know, graduate student like 40 years ago, 50 years ago, um, when he first wrote that paper, we were like, oh, good luck with that. But now fast forward in 2011, a coalition got and forced the hand of some of our Republican elected officials who enacted marriage. That's good old fashioned coalition building. That's good old fashioned bridge building, which Barbara did so well when she was in Congress and there aren't enough of her. And, and then we raised the money that we had to to backstop the elected officials on the Republican side that were frankly at the time very bold and very courageous. It was considered huge. It, it was considered very bold and very aggressive to have done such a thing as to have the Republicans join with the Democrats to allow marriage equality. And from there, then we went to Minnesota and Washington and Oregon, and we took the movement that we showed how it worked with the mixed legislatures, and we showed people how to do this, and it started snowballing. And, and then we overturned Prop 8, um, with the Republican and Democrat lawyer um, by the name of Ted Olson and, 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 and David. Um, right, yes. Uh, right, Vossi. So the, those two gentlemen um, helped us um, overturn marriage equality and then took it, of course, to the U.S. Supreme Court, where we uh, finally won Obergefell. And now marriage equality um, is everywhere, and it's the law of the land, thank God. And but it, it, it's really thanks to all the work that our Democrat friends did over many decades and that we were able to come in and do the next little piece. And that is getting just enough, not all the Republicans, but just enough in, in various legislatures um, all across the country. So that I believe we had 32 states that supported marriage equality before Obergefell. Um, was passed in the U.S. Supreme Court as law. So that's how it, that's kind of what happened. And I'm not, I don't want to overstate my role. It was just small. Um, but it's bridge building, I think, is a really important part of the drive of what we do and not just raising money, but it's a willingness uh, to work across the aisle, which isn't easy these days. No, and I know when we've had discussions with the group, you know, with, with, with the students, one of the things they very much are interested in is hearing about how people work together like that. So thank you 
for sharing that because that is more common than you see. And particularly for those who have a heart for public service, do know that that goes on in those relationships that, you know, Annie talks about and how she brought them together were, were really key. And so whatever it is, the issues you have passion for or the, um, you know, the candidates that you want to support, you know, do, I, I hope, you know, you see a lot of ugliness today. And I think that's what, you know, why, uh, is to, you know, like the Sign Institute is so important and other groups that do this because it's saying, yes, policy matters. Yes, you can have an impact. And I think you you don't always hear these stories every day. I point out, you know, Ted Olson actually was a conservative Federalist Society lawyer who, when he got confirmed to be the Solicitor General who argues all the U.S. cases in front of the Supreme Court in 2000, it was after he had won Bush v. Gore that was very contentious <laughs> Uh, on that election that was very close, he barely got confirmed and was thought, you know, was attacked as, you know, right wing and this and that. And then here he was somebody who did want to join on this and just some grief that he got from his side of the aisle. But of course, he's a wonderful um, uh, litigator in front of the Supreme Court and, and won that case. And I'll when it, my, my neighbor across the street, uh, Justice Kennedy, wrote the decision. So, you know, how the relationships in your life all come together in things that will always be um, interesting. Absolutely. But, but do know, you know, I, I think we always emphasize that, that, that the relationships in politics and your passion and interest on issues are the most important. And never sacrifice what you believe in thinking, oh, I'm in this party, so I can't say this. I, if some of you may have seen yesterday, and if you haven't, take a look at it. Um, Senator Lisa Murkowski, a Republican, who's being attacked by Trump and primaried, and Ooh. Joe Manchin <laughs> heard a lot in the news, um, who is also getting attacked as a Democrat. You know, he's in West Virginia. If he weren't elected, it would be a Republican there. Um, these are both people who I enjoyed working with when I was in Congress. Mm -hmm. And yesterday they were on TV talking about how they could work together and they each endorsed each other. <laughs> it was great. But I want to see Lisa reelected because they were both part of the coalition. It was awesome. The infrastructure bill done. And so these are yeah. the constructive members. I'm confident that Lisa will get through. We're all working to get her reelected. Uh, so those are an example of two people who do work and get things done. And I know if you're a Democrat, you may be upset with Joe Manchin. If you're a Republican, you could be upset with Lisa. But do know those are, you know, we're 50-50 in Congress. And when you're close like that, you have to be willing to work together. And unfortunately, it's a small group of people who will work together. And when people say, why can't Joe go along with this? It's like, there's only 50 senators. Yeah. I say, why can't the other 49 mm -hmm try and just curb back things to get what they want to get Joe to go along. I mean, that shouldn't be that hard. When I was in Congress, you have to count, you know, to 218 if you're in the House or mm. 50 if you're in the Senate with a, your, your mm. own party's vice president. And too yep. often today, people just want to yell at everybody, whether it's Kirsten Sinema or Joe yep. Manchin or Lisa Murkowski or Susan Collins. And instead, what we used to do is say, well, let's you know, instead of thinking you're going to get a home run, try and get a base hit and move the ball right. on your issues. And that's something I think from yes. as, as Annie and the other groups that we worked with brought us together to work together. I, I think one of the good things about having more women in Congress is I think you do see the women trying to be part of those coalitions. Um, right. Sometimes more, because if you look at, you know, Bernie, I don't think is it really passed Bernie. If you're a Bernie Sanders fan, I'm sorry to tell you that he hasn't passed many bills. Um, on the other side, Marjorie Taylor Greene, who we did not support <laughs> uh, as winning for women, or yeah. Bupac, which I'm, I also uh, am with them. Um, she hasn't passed any bills, nor will she ever. And um, so at any rate. Uh, yeah. Barbara, can I brag uh, on you? What they look for and people who get things done, whether, uh, but we've found those state and local people who have to get it done are both yeah. better candidates and better members when they get in. I, I just want to brag on you for a minute. Um, you know, we talked about, you know, coalition building, building bridges. Um, and sometimes it's standing 
and taking a stand when even your own party disagrees. And one of the votes that I know was, um, was considered controversial, though in my mind it's not at all, um, was when you took a stand for trans being in the military, I believe it was. And, you know, a lot of Republicans were, you know, running over there to, you know, trample on the rights of the trans community. And you stood tall and that actually hurt you in your reelection. Um, but you know what? I would rather die on my principles of, you know, standing up for human beings and human rights than being elected to any office. Um, that principal position is really, you know, a model. And Barbara, you're, you're one of the people that knows um, one of my secrets. Um, I guess it wasn't a secret, but in 2016, I put myself, you know, it, it, for the young folks that are on uh, this call, you're, you're, you're going to appreciate this, I believe. I, was, I put myself on the platform committee as a delegate at the 2016 Republican convention. Okay. And that was Donald Trump's convention. I didn't support him. I didn't endorse him. Never have, never voted for him, never would. And I, I could speak for hours on this point, but Barbara does it for me um, <laughs> on air, so I, I won't go into it. But at that convention, they were putting language in the party platform that was anti-gay, much less anti-transgender. So I went after them and did a little speech. Well, anybody who knows me knows that, you know, I don't have one of those great, deep, wonderful voices. And so here I am with my little voice uh, doing, doing a speech of fine to a party platform committee that was booing me, all right, while I talked favorably about having a party be about addition and not subtraction. And um, I'm like, let my people go, let my gays in, you know, a lot of gay people, uh, my friends and family members that are gay, very much support a fiscal conservative agenda, but just don't want the wacky parts, right? So I spoke, I spoke against the wacky parts. Well, I, it went viral. And somebody turned to me um, later in the day, and they said, you're trending. Now, this is back in 2016. And I was not even on Facebook. Yet. <laughs> so like, like I knew what trending was, I was like, oh, that's nice. What does that mean? I had turned to somebody and said, what does trending mean? So I, I needed to get the, you know, the local vernacular. And they said, you're going viral. And millions of people are watching, are, you know, watching this video. And I had no idea six and a half million people ended up viewing this video, which is crazy to me because I have one, I have the world's worst voice. But here's why I believe they listen, Barbara. It's because, you know, we took a stand and so many people, you know, don't at the right moment. And it needed to be said, even if it was the worst voice. You know, even if I'm not one of those with the booming, you know, great voice made for radio types, you know, it was, there was a sweetness to it that made me think, okay, there's hope. And 50,000 people wrote me notes saying nobody has ever stood up and said that up to that point. And we are so grateful to be told that we're welcome to join either party and that we're not going to be spit on and that somebody gives a damn. And so you never know when your voice is, I guess, what I'm saying um, is needed, even if you don't think you're the best speaker or the most articulate or the, the best presentation in the group. If your heart is there, if you apply your heart and your belief system and you stand I really believe it goes a long way. Oh, thank you. No, and so in, and I, I think so much of us young people are looking at politics and policy as a career. Do know you can be very successful while also being principled. It's an important thing. And we are gonna have to let Annie go at two o'clock. So we do have a few minutes. If, if anyone has some questions that you wanna ask in the chat, 
please um, do put them in as we are um, for our last few minutes that we we have Annie and I uh, did want to say you know that that was a powerful moment when Annie did that both of us are friends of Liz Cheney so we're seeing you know look what happened to Liz this weekend and and dealing with this but I do think as as Annie has proved and and so many before her if you don't know the story of Margaret Chase Smith who stood up against Joe McCarthy in the 50s it took four years before the guys came along and did it, but finally they censured Joe McCarthy and that was the end of him. But uh, she was pretty much alone when, uh, when she started Margaret Chase Smith. So that's another woman to look at. So I, I do think for women, as you're thinking about running and doing things like, you know, it's getting involved in your community. It's caring about those local constituent issues, your roads, your schools, things like that. But then things converge into other big issues, depending on the time. And, uh, you know, Annie had that opportunity because she was there. Liz, as you know, this was not something Liz, you know, nobody wanted to have January 6th happen. This was not something that she wanted to yeah. be in. But, you know, often here you stand, I can do no other type of times. And um, I, I think often you see whether it's Lisa Murkowski doing that, Susan Collins, Liz, or, you know, I'm sure there'll be other women before the year is out, we'll see um, with that type of thing. So um, I'm not, uh, okay, I'm see, okay, jump, maybe I'm missing some of these. If, so if I am, or our, our, our interns who are on, if you want to, if you have questions, do feel, if you want to jump in at this point too. Um, but uh, what was I thinking? As, you know, as you think about running in terms of time frame, and we'll, we'll talk about this a little after too also, but um, what have you seen in terms of the women who come forward that kind of jump in and kind of have the best kind of run of things? What have been some of the common traits that you've seen over the years? Yeah, um, you know, being a leader in your community it does help if you're running for a federal office um, to have a state office like you did, Barbara, um, to either be a city council or a mayor or a state assembly or a state senate, um, to have a race behind you where you build a constituency, where you hone your ideas, you practice your craft, you learn the art of knocking on doors and calling people and ask, asking strangers for money, those hard things. Um, you know, having that experience and being willing to begin at a local level. Now, we have had success with business leaders, mm -hmm. um, having women, uh, Lisa McLean in Michigan and others who were ran a business um, in their community and they were members of, you know, Elks or, you know, uh, Rotarians or all the local yeah, chamber yeah. and really being active in their community. Um, but activism um, is really the key element, is really um, showing others that you care um, and doing that outreach and being good at it. In other words, not just showing up to run for Congress, with little to no background other than I want it, you know? So somebody really who has gotten their resume ready, um, they prepared for the moment is, um, you know, somebody that we begin to look at and recruit. Yeah, no, and that's, and, and I think oftentimes people look for celebrities instead, and oftentimes the celebrities will get beaten by say a state Senator, I know, for, for those of you who may be seeing Jamie Raskin, who's a Democrat in the news, and he's here locally in our area, very prominent on the January 6th committee, he was a either a state representative or state senator before he ran for Congress. And interesting, because I remember we were in running around the same time, um, a local news anchor, actually Kathleen Matthews, who was married to Chris Matthews, made a big splash jumping in because she had been a news anchor, you know, was the wife of, kind of thing and everyone thought she was going to be the nominee and Jamie was the person who you know he wasn't a celebrity he was just grinding away doing his his uh, state house job and knew his community and you know it was I think there were some other 
kind of can't, you know, but he came through that. So, and oftentimes, like right now, you have Trump people who are jumping in who have no experience, haven't even lived in an area, and they jump in. And right. I think you're going to see them get beat by a local city council or a state senator, too, because even people who might like Trump look and say, yeah, but, you know, this person, you know, they did my road. They did. Yeah. I already know them. Trump doesn't know them. He's down in Mar-a-Lago. He just endorsed them because right. somebody right. was making money off of this guy, which is actually. Yeah. Usual. Yeah. And so that pe trust voters, particularly when you talk to, you know, and that's why people say, oh, I can't run because of this, or I don't know these people or do that. When you're locally engaged and serve in your community, um, you know, people appreciate that more than many other things. But I want to let Annie have the last word now that she's got to jump. Oh, no, this has been a delight. And, um, you know, happy to talk to um, men or women um, offline that might be interested in either running for office or, you know, advancing their career through political or community um, service. There's a lot of ways to serve and, you know, follow your passion, follow your heart, be willing to build bridges and be willing to work really hard um, and it'll pay off. So I well, hope that I, I hope it's a help a little bit and uh, good luck to all of those getting ready to graduate. We know the last couple of years has not been easy. I mean, COVID has really um, had a demonstrable effect on everybody and I lost a family member as uh, Barbara, you were nice to mention my sister, Kathy. She looms large in my heart. Um, so all of you though, even if you haven't lost somebody near and dear to you, you've lost time and money and energy and, and it's been a little depressing and dark feeling, but just know there is light, um, walk toward that light, you know, um, and make yourselves great and, um, know that there's people like Barbara and myself and others, um, and your you family and friends that care deeply about you and want you to have a great future because really your success is the future of our nation. Nothing shy of it. So um, I, I wish for your great success, for your good fortune and your good health. And let me know if I can help. Great. Well, thank you so yeah. much. So You're welcome, Barbara. Time. And, Lots uh, of love. Okay. You take care and we will okay, see, see you on the other end somewhere. And now we are going to bring in our interns to uh, Emily and Lily to uh, help me go through um, a little slideshow that we have just to tell you about some of the other groups that are involved and a little bit of, of the sort of universe that's out there helping um, women run. So uh, women on the run is a group <laughs> that's out there. And I believe, I don't know, we, have, we don't have the um, website here, but that's maybe the gal, that's a group that helps young women um, get out there and just get engaged. It's bipartisan, right, ladies? We have Lily and Emily here. Yeah, Lily, I think if you want to go to the next slide is where we start talking about the different groups. Um, there we go. Great. Um, Barbara, I don't know if you want to take the lead on this or if you want us to. Sure. Well, you know, we have so many, as Annie pointed out, PACs and training organizations. So you, you all jump in when we can. And Winning for Women is what Annie was involved in um, and, and headed up and started. And I'm on, I'm on their board. But we have a lot of others that support Democrats, Republicans, and they're nonpartisan who help women, you know, elect women, and they've been involved there um, for a long time. So um, do, you know, wherever you're coming from on issues or, um, you know, uh, party or whatever, these groups, there, there's one for you that you can find. And we haven't even been exhaustive here with all of them. We just wanted to give you a sample of them. Obviously, I'm familiar with some of them more than others. So um, we can start going through some of them here. The first, I think, up we had 
uh, Winning for Women, which this was just a little screenshot of, uh, and, and actually Winning for Women, I will tell you, is staffed and run all by women. So that's a nice thing too. <laughs> um, we also try and find women consultants and promote them. Also, that's been, I should have mentioned that with Annie, but that's been something she's been very much involved in, engaged in, and is having more women pollsters, more women operatives, because oftentimes they have a, they'll, they'll have bring a better perspective to the campaign. You often find, you know, like I, the guys will send you mail that has pictures on it that's like all men or <laughs> it's all white men. And you're like, that's not my world. <laughs> you know, I don't want that. And, you know, other women will understand that better. So Olivia here, um, you know, is talking about how Republican women broke records in house races in 2020. So this was the what we were mentioning that we wanted to get 20 women in 2020. And instead, we got 31 or and then I think we got an extra one in in a special election. Actually, there was a one of our women who got elected in 2021. She was a woman who lost her husband um, to COVID because it was before the vaccine came out. Um, he won election in November. He died in December, tragically. She's a young mom. And she ran for his seat and won it. She has been a great advocate on getting vaccines, which, as you know, Republican part, Party, her name is Julia Letlow. She's from Louisiana. Oftentimes when our party was not that friendly to vaccines, Julia had that personal story where she went out on national news and locally and said, you know, my husband wasn't able to have the vaccine and now I'm a widow. Um, please get the vaccine. And um, I know Annie and I share that passion too about uh, because we've seen politics, unfortunately, um, you know, impact on, on that front. So um, again, uh, you know, I think some, and as we mentioned, we did not support Marjorie Green or some of the others. <laughs> so, but Julia was one of the great ones we did get to support. So go to the next one here that we have. Um, Okay, right now, yeah, I'll cover the Republicans. I'll let you gals cover the other ones because I don't. Um, this is a, a smaller group uh, right now, Women PAC, that does, you know, Joni Ernst, who's a senator from Iowa, is here. Um, oftentimes, as we discussed in our last class, when you have like a woman senator or a woman governor like Iowa does, it kind of inspires um, more women to come forward. In, in Iowa last cycle, we elected a woman who was a state senator to Congress and another woman who was a military doctor who had run before and lost and ran again. So now Iowa has this great coalition of state and um, federal leaders. And as a result, you end up having more women want to run when they see women at the top here. Um, and this is, and that's true on the Democrat side too. And I, I'll mention as an aside, and I know she was supported by Emily's list last time, and I'm not sure now, but she's a dear friend. And um, if we don't get her to talk to the class, which I'm hoping we might, I, I will promote her anywhere for anyone who are Democrats or just interested in general. Donna Edwards is running again for Congress in her old seat in Maryland. And I know she was a beneficiary of Emily's list. And because the person who took her seat when she ran for Senate, she did not get the nomination there, um, but she, um, he's now running for something else. So she is running in Maryland. And right now in Maryland, there is no woman in the congressional delegation. So she will be the only one. So if you're interested, you're a Democrat and you wanna uh, work on a local campaign um, to help uh, correct a, in a delegation that has no women, um, Maryland uh, could, uh, and, and whoever wins that primary most likely will win that seat because it is a very strongly Democrat seat. Um, so uh, Donna is um, there. Now go to the next slide. <laughs> Um, this is Susan B. Anthony um, PAC. It is a pro-life PAC that's on the conservative side. Um, so their, pro their issue is mostly, you know, single issue. There are also um, on the other side, uh, there are pro-choice PACs that are for women that are just focused on that side too. So next slide. And this is Republican Women for Progress. This is a group that is not friendly to Donald Trump, but they want to remain Republicans. And so, and they do, I know, um, 
support women on both sides and the, you know, and the abortion issue is often, um, you know, there obviously are pro-choice Republican women too. So you have uh, Republican women for Congress, uh, for progress there. And next, ViewPAC, which I'm on the board of, which is also, new, you know, a lot of these, PAC, Winning for Women and ViewPAC, they are neutral on, on, on some of the, you know, social issues where Republicans differ. They, you know, look at the district and the women who can get elected. And so ViewPAC, had, this was just some, you know, kind of highlights the victories that women had um, in uh, last year's cycle, which was, so here we have $20 million were invested was invested, that was, that was VPAC and um, Winning for Women also had a, a good cycle there. It's 33, actually, okay, 33. I was even, uh, I, I was lowballing it there uh, that were elected. And then um, 11 of the seats that went from red to blue, they were um, all either women, minority, sometimes both, or um, military, again, sometimes both overlapping there. So the candidates who were not the white male candidates were the ones who flipped those seats. So that investment ended up being a great investment on that front. And because of the success of winning for women and BUPAC and others and getting more diversity into the Republican party, that has been, you know, as people look to as their retirements, as there are, and that's what you oftentimes, whether it's on the state or local level, as you see people who, and you look and say, okay, that guy's, you know, getting up in years, he may be retiring. That's, you know, that's an area where a woman leader could run for a city council, run for a state house. When I ran for the state house, um, my general assembly in Virginia, the person who had been in that seat had been in the seat for 40 years. It was a Republican guy. He retired in 2000 seven, I did not run then, and was replaced by a Democrat woman. And so then because a woman had won that seat after 40 years, Republicans kind of came to me and said, hey, we'd like a woman. You know, it was sort of like, hey, we got to run against a woman. Could we get a woman to run? I mean, unfortunately, sometimes that's how the guys think. But now the women, I mean, I unfortunately had to be asked. Um, I wasn't thinking of doing it. That's why I'm involved in these groups now, because all of you, and all women out there shouldn't have to be, wait to be asked to the prom. You should be thinking of yourself being leaders, whether it's in your business, in your local community, in your, you know, whatever groups you're involved in, be a leader and think about yourself and your other, you know, female friends or just friends in lots of different areas and, and say, hey, you should run. Because a lot of times women, for minority candidates or, or other, you know, less represented groups, no one ever says to them, you should run. And until, uh, unfortunately, it was, well, I mean, not unfortunately, it was my boss, a male from a prior life who said, hey, we need somebody to run. We need, he didn't say, hey, we need a woman to run. He actually called me and said, you should think about doing this. So he wasn't the one that said that, but others did. Um, but um, that, I, I realized I hadn't thought of that myself, that I had to have a guy come tell me. And so I said, never again, let's not do that. So next slide. <laughs> okay, I'll let, I'll get, let you gals uh, take it away on this. And, and uh, we've already talked a little bit about Emily's list, but I'll let you fill it in. Sure, so Emily's List is a PAC that was started. Um, it was one of the first PACs that just supported women. Um, and their specific goal is to elect democratic pro-choice women. So it's kind of the antithesis of the Susan B. Anthony PAC. Um, and they focus specifically on the issue of pro-choice. So they only support women candidates who are pro-choice. Um, and they support women at the local, state, and federal level. So they have a list that members of the, of like members of Emily's List can go and they're required to donate, I believe, $200 a month. So they pick how to split that money up between all of the candidates that Emily's List endorses. Um, so they've supported uh, plenty of women like Elizabeth Warren, they've supported local women, um, and they have helped sort of turn the tide so that more women get elected to office recently. Yes, and in 2018, as Annie mentioned, they just had a huge banner year in 2018 in electing women because that was the highest, and it was, it was the highest number of women any ever it went up to like, I guess 101, or it went over 100. Um, 
Actually, it got over 100 when I got elected in 14, but it was the highest number of Democrat women. Um, but most of the women that were in Congress was 89 to 11. It was pretty pathetic. Now it's, uh, I think we mentioned, yeah, we're 30, so we still have a long way to go. <laughs> Um, Ignite is also, uh, they work with training young women. So they also are um, focused on democratic women and training particularly young women who are in their early, uh, late 20s, early 30s to run for office so that they can um, have younger leaders in Congress who they believe are more representative of, you know, the next generation and um, younger people's values and ideas. Yeah, and I know I did, see, you know, in Virginia, um, we in 2017, you know, in response to Trump, we saw a lot of women step up and run in the state house. Unfortunately, I mean, not not unfortunately. I want to say unfortunately because a friend of mine did become speaker, but um, <laughs> in 19 actually. But a lot of women started running in response to Donald Trump on the Democrat side. And this, I know, ignite what you know. I would see women taking those, you know, the classes, and that's. One of the things that's, you know, it's, it's just always interesting to go to a campaign class or a class about leadership whenever you get that opportunity. And there's a lot, you know, or just hear from people, um, you know, even if it's not, you know, on your side of the aisle, particularly, I, I find the techniques and the things often cross over. Like Donna Edwards and I can talk about campaigns and the battles we have to uh, face and oftentimes they're very similar, even though we're in different parties. And um, um, our speaker in the House who became speaker in 2019, Democrat, because of the women who ran in the state, in the General Assembly in Virginia, it was a big group of women. And so they ended up having their first speaker ever, who was a woman in Virginia, Eileen Fillercorn, and their majority leader, was an African-American woman who's here from Northern Virginia. So two women from Northern Virginia who, when I went into, when I was in the General Assembly, it was like 67 Republicans in 2013. And by 2019, those two women had been in, you know, in a deep minority had flipped things. And so the power of women uh, to do that. Now it has flipped back, but it's very narrow. Um, and but one of the ways Republicans flipped it back this past year is we had more women running also to get some of those seats. And I think you will see, and I, I know because I've seen some things already, the Democrat and Republican women work together um, more on some like on education issues and things like that that are obviously post-pandemic an, an issue. So I know there are two. Democrat and two Republican women who are working on, you know, how can we, you know, kind of bring some togetherness on the education issue, given it's such a big issue. Um, Running Start is another, it's nonpartisan, and they were founded, I believe, in the early 2000s by a Democrat and Republican, and they have a congressional board as well that has both Democrat and Republican Congress people on it. Um, and it was founded to train young women, particularly high school and college students to run for office. So they do lots of trainings focused on, um, they have a summer program for high school students and they do one day long trainings at colleges as well to encourage young women to start running for um, you know, student government association as an introduction to the political process and running for office that can then pave the way for them to run in the future as well for higher office or state or local office. Yeah, that is a great group because it's very young people focused. And again, it gets your mind about you can be a leader in, in just thinking that way. So the next um, organization that we're trying to highlight that we're highlighting here is called She Should Run. And it um, is a nonpartisan organization that encourages women to run for political office, but also provide these women research, research and general support throughout their journeys. Um, and they have this nice little blurb on their website about what, how women represent a majority of the U.S. population, but they represent less than a third of the nation's elected leaders, as Barbara has been talking about today. Um, so they're trying to kind of fix this issue by promoting women to go to run for office by identifying and tackling the barriers to electing leadership. So they're trying to convince women from all political leanings, ethnicities, sexual identities, and backgrounds to use themselves 
and see themselves as future candidates. Oh, I didn't see, oh, was, okay, somebody mentioned in the chat that, um, that uh, Amy, who is our director, was at Emily's List. Is that correct? Am I getting that right? So we see our women in leadership here at AU. And I, if I'm not mistaken, is she should run the group that also highlights a lot of these sexist kind of language in the media and they do some of that. Is that the group that highlights that on their blog and they kind of, you know, kind of, kind of try and get the media reporting, you know, oftentimes it, it's not, there have been studies done that show like the media reporting on women candidates often focuses more, you know, on their clothes, on their hair, you know, on, you know, on physical things instead of their smarts, right? And I do think one of that, I think that is changing. It still hasn't changed as much as it needs to because nobody, you don't see, you know, some, well, I, I often said if, you know, if somebody, a, a female, if there was a female version of Donald Trump, um, you know, she would be a, mocked a lot more, certainly physically, right? People would, or who said the kind of things they said, they'd say she's, you know, crazier than they say he is. So I, I always would, you know, when people made those sexist comments, you know, point out if a, if a, if you if a guy did these kind of things, what would you say? <laughs> you know, and that's um, hopefully, you know, uh, she should, groups like she should run and others who are calling this out now more enable make it easier for women to get in and not have to deal with that. But that's why I, I do think it's important, um, you know, whether you're uh, working on a campaign or working for, you know, for getting a, a woman elected, thinking of it yourself, or just out there in the policy world, having a support group of women yourself, both within your sort of community of work as well as outside, is so important. And what these groups all do is they give you a virtual connection. You can get involved with them too. But even if you aren't able to go to their things, whatever, you have that online discussion and seeing that and having them kind of do that work for you, something that I, I just never had back in the day. You know, I, I went to a campaign school, I did this. Now it's just proliferated. And I think it really, you know, we will accelerate getting to that 50% mark um, much more rapidly. And as we discussed last time, you know, there, still there's, you know, lots of governor, you know, states that haven't had female governors or attorneys general or, um, or senators. So there's still a lot, and, and then they haven't had, you know, women of color, um, you know, different sexual identities. So that is all changing uh, rapidly and both in the state level. And that's why when, Sometimes breaking a barrier on the state level in one of those ways makes, and, and then you've established, wow, you know, they've done all these things and then it's, it's much easier to then run for federal or statewide. So the next resources that we're going to highlight are kind of more online resources. So the, the AU Woman in Politics newsletter through the AU Woman in Politics Institute is a very great newsletter that highlights recent um, events about women in politics and it gives more information about that. And then the Rutgers Center for Women in American Politics is also really great at giving an online database kind of of all the recent um, voting turnouts, how women are elected, what the voting is like, and kind of all of that information. It's another great online resource for that one as well. And then an, one final one is the Women's Public Leadership Network. So it provides a lot of women with knowledge, resources, and support to make running for public offices more accessible. So um, it's, their mission statement is to see more women like you at decision-making tables by educating, organizing, and inspiring these women um, to run for these offices. Right, and I would highly recommend everyone get that, the American University, you know, Women Lead, I think it's called Women Lead. I, I get it every week and there's, oh, it, they really compile um, just all kinds of interesting information of interviews and all the women's uh, issues that are going on. Um, uh, it, it really crosses into a lot of different areas on domestic and foreign policy and media 
and just covers a whole gamut of things and often tells you about maybe podcasts or things that you can turn into or watch that have already happened. And I, I find them a great resource. And then the Rutgers University has done those studies for years that a lot of the numbers that I drew from in our first class, they, they compile that. So you can look at your state um, or your area of the country and see historically how many women have been there. Like I mentioned, I was the only, I guess only the fourth woman ever elected in Virginia to Congress. And I did not know that when I ran, like that wasn't in my mind how, how you know, there've been hundreds before and now uh, as a woman, when you walk into the, those, so many of these buildings or Library of Congress or, you know, Congress, and you look up on the walls, it's mostly white men. And you all will be part of that next generation that is going to change that and make those portraits on the walls of, of speakers and chairmen and chairwoman and uh, just look more like America. And I know we, one of our classes coming up, we're going to um, be talking about the Supreme Court and that's out of 115 members of the Supreme Court. Well, 108 of them have been white men. I believe it is only seven haven't been. Um, so uh, that's obviously a big discussion that's going on right now. Um, you know, when, uh, Ronald Reagan, when I was, I was in law school, when Ronald Reagan uh, first got into office, I, is about when I went into law school and Sandra Day O'Connor was his first appointment. That was very exciting for me. She spoke at my graduation. Like I was finally looking at somebody on the Supreme Court who uh, looked like me, but there's still a lot of other firsts for the Supreme Court, obviously, but she had had three kids. Um, and when she got out of school. She was the second in her class at Stanford. The first was um, the person who ended up being chief justice, which was um, Rehnquist. And they both knew each other in law school. They had very different paths getting to the Supreme Court because when she got out of law school, she couldn't get a law job. He obviously could. Fortunately, because Ronald Reagan said, I do want to put a woman on the court. Now, he knew there were lots of good people, lots of women to check from. So that's why I, I, I do not take any issue with, with uh, um, President Biden saying he wants to select from a particular group because I know among that group that he is choosing from, there are dozens and dozens of qualified women now, none of whom have ever been able to get this position. And I think there's no, when Trump was in office, he said when Ruth Bader Ginsburg um, uh, passed away. He wanted to nominate a woman. He also made it a policy that he would only select from the federal society, uh, you know, the approved list. So he narrowed his list in certain ways. And so there's nothing wrong with, um, I think, presidents narrowing the list. Sorry, I'm going off on my Supreme Court rant. But um, I think this is, these kind of issues come up and everywhere. And um, I'm a, often embarrassed to see uh, some of the guys in my party who take issue with this when um, uh, you, when, when of course they, they have no, you know, they're being hypocritical with what Republicans have done in the past, obviously. But um, yes, our next class, uh, as we wind down here, um, our next class is going to be on, let's see, February 28th, I believe. Is that, am I getting that correct? And it is going to, I, I believe we are going to be um, speaking with a yet to be announced, um, either candidate or somebody who's already in office so they can kind of tell you what it's like and um, give you a little flavor of their path. You've heard from Annie today about sort of how they work with them and get them there and the leaders she's seen. Um, and then we thought it would be good to hear from uh, directly from the candidates and uh, get a little flavor of that 24 seven that is a candidate's life. I, I can tell you from personal experience, there is nothing um, except probably motherhood. Yeah, motherhood, <laughs> new babies are 24 seven and campaigns are like having you know, a new baby for two years <laughs> and, and they don't, and you're just always running, running, running. 
and, and doing that. So, and, and not sleeping a lot, uh, but it's, you know, it's a great privilege as we've discussed and it's exciting for me to, whether it's my friend Donna Edwards or um, the 33 women who were elected well, minus a few who I don't care for <laughs> in 2020 um, that are uh, are now in office that um, we're proud to uh, see them. So um, thank you again for joining us today. Um, I guess we did have we have campaign schools here. Did we? I forgot we still had some more. So we can we have this deck that we can send to you also, and because the campaign schools are run by parties, they're run by some of these books. They're run by Yale Law School. I believe Harvard has one also. Those they're all good. You can find them at little to no cost, up to spending considerable money. Um, you know, I've usually ask a candidate or somebody you know in politics what's a good one in your area, and and again, you can also find some things online too. So. Um, Thank you again for joining us today, and we will uh, look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you.